Akech, amosi ahinya ka geno ni ngima. An benda ngima maber. Something very special has happened. We have a visitor from America. After 27 years, he is suddenly here. My brother. My father was killed, right? and uh, he was a lure. And the story that was told when I was young was uh, of this brilliant young African who'd come to America to learn the white man's magic and then bring it back to Kenya to develop the country. Right? And uh, you know, he had arrived in Hawaii when, in 1961, or maybe a little bit earlier, 1958. It was right before Kenyan independence. And you know, I think he was part of that first generation of, uh, of young Africans who um, went west with all kinds of promise. Uh, and that's where he met my mother and they got married. And, um, and then he left for when I was about two. And you know, over the years, we'd write occasionally. And I finally got a chance to meet him when I was like 10. Um, and, uh, you know, he was a very impressive figure, and, um, a little frightening because he was, uh, you know, had this deep voice and this British accent and was quite bossy and sure of himself and uh, intimidating. <laughs> about the beauty of black people just being around a lot of black people. Yeah, feeling as if um, they're all around you and, and the, uh, the, in some sense you belong. Even though, ironically, a lot of Africans will look at black Americans and say, ah, they're wazungus, or, you know, they're white people. Ironically, it was the death of our father that brought us together. Since then, we had kept in touch through letters. Our letters, however, did not prepare us for when we would finally meet. I was afraid that Barak, my brother, would not be comfortable with us. I was also afraid that we would not know how to relate to him. After all, he was from a totally different world to ours. The most important thing for me coming back was seeing my family, and, and that was the main, um, the main purpose, and I think the thing that moved me the most was going to Home Square and uh, meeting my grandmother and my brothers and my uncles. So you like this? Yes. Ah. Okay, let's try it on. We, we have to try it, try it. <laughs> even though it's hot, you tell her, even though it's hot, we still have to try it just to make sure it fits. Uh, 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 it's good. It's good. Mm. It's good. <laughs> what do you English? <laughs> uh. Oh, yeah, it's a good one. It's a good one. Oh, there. 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 My brother does not speak Luo, our mother tongue. We're forced to talk in English, a white among blacks, the family jokes. Through discussion, Barak is able to learn about the traditions of his forefathers. Unfortunately, a lot of the explanations for the ways of the Luo are not known anymore. The answers to his questions are often vague and unsatisfactory. Why is it that Abongo had to build a hut down in that direction, down there? Why did, he have to, why did we have to move out of the house? What did this mean? What move did it mean? out of this compound. Right. Yeah. Yeah. What did it mean? Traditionally, somebody like Abongo, mm. he can't build in the grandfather's compound. He's not allowed. He's not allowed. So if he wants to so build, he has to build outside out. the compound. Uh, I can't leave and make my own home out or uh, outside the compound right. before Matt does that one. Because we, uh, we inherited it from our four grandfathers and it's traditionally uh, stereotyped like that. You just can't do it because they say that if I just do it, 
Mm. If he comes back, he doesn't step into my compound. Do people feel like they've lost something when, uh, um, you know, the, uh, you said it's just a tradition, nobody knows why. I mean, how does that make you feel? When, or how does that make you feel, Yusuf, when, when you know, the, uh, we you still know, have these traditions, but they're, you know, they're some, thin some now. We're not sure which ones are which, and nobody follows them anymore, and some people follow them, and some people don't. And is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? The, uh, it's not good because, you know, there are some reasons why they were playing such a tradition, right. but uh, some of the reasons are hidden. Right. You can just complain. Only the old it. people may know the reason, right. but they will not like to tell you. Right. Yeah. They'll just say, tell you, all right? No? That is bad, don't do it. But the reason, they won't tell you. I watch the goings-on with mixed feelings. The new member of the family does not seem to have in any way disrupted the daily routine. It is as if his being there is to the family only proof of the fact that the son they lost and whose name Barra carries has returned to be among them. Two brothers. Do they understand each other? Is it possible for Barak, at this stage, to get to know and to understand the traditions and ways of his father's people? In order to answer his question, I myself have to ask. Mm. You know, I was too young to really organize a trip here myself. Didn't have the money and didn't have the time. And was probably, you know, somewhat um, frightened of what I might find here because, you know, I think when you're when you're young, you always want to uh, you always want to fit in. And uh, the idea of Africa, although my image of Africa was always positive, mainly because of my father, I, I didn't really get all, I didn't internalize a lot of the negative images of Africa because the uh, people always would say how smart he was and how distinguished he was. And everybody was always impressed with him and had all these stories about him. Um, it was still very foreign. It was something I didn't know. We take a walk to show my brother and his fiancée the neighborhood. My brother is surprised by what he sees. Where are all the villages that we always see in books on Africa, he asks. According to those books, we all live on one compound with a chief's hut in the middle. He is told that such villages do not exist in Lua country. They were built during colonialism to serve the system. Having all the families together, was a means of watching and controlling the Africans more effectively. Normally, only one family lives on a compound. Between the compounds, there are acres of farmland. As I got to know the country better, as I've written newspapers and I talked to Kenyans, then uh, those initial, very personal impressions start blending in with political impressions about the country. We meet a student who has been sent home from the university. The students demonstrated because of the introduction of tuition fees. The police came and started shooting at them. All universities in the country have been closed till further notice. So what will happen uh, if, you, if your parents have signed, they're saying they're going to pay, but then they don't have the money. What will happen? Well, if you don't pay, you don't live in the university, you don't go for tuition. So you can't it, 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 Yeah, it's as, good as, it's as good as missing your place. I see. Yeah. So basically, it looks like right now what's happening is the, uh, this, is a, this is a way that the government uh, is going to reduce the number of university students. Kind of. Uh, because the students who can't afford to pay at this point, they won't be able to go. How, how am 
Grandma, how is this woman related to us? Yeah. Ask Granny. She's saying hello. How are you, my son? How do you say mother? Mama. Ah, mama. Uh, you wouldn't have imagined, could you? Our visit finally comes to an end, but the journey continues. My brother wants to discover the rest of his father's country. We take leave of the family. Seeing my father's grave and my grandfather's grave uh, and feeling accepted by them and, 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 and embracing them uh, was important uh, for me and sort of filled the hole that I had felt for a long time. It is understandably difficult for a visitor not to be impressed by the beauty of this country. My brother is no exception. Whereas I am skeptical, I see the country through the eyes of a Kenyan, my brother, an outsider, is able to enjoy its beauty. Proudly, he shows his fiancée his second home. In my eyes, the beauty that they see and are so impressed by is marred by my knowledge of how excluded almost all Kenyans are from this experience. These strangers move about our country as a matter of course and with disturbing confidence. It seems to me that as far as the tourists are concerned, there are no limitations. I observe my people being exhibited, exhibiting themselves. Who would want to miss such a spectacle, a folks exhibition? On this day, my brother refused to come on the tour. It makes me frustrated to see that uh, that you know blacks in Kenya don't have more confidence in uh, the possibility of shaping their own fate and their own destiny. I'm deeply saddened by a sense that whites are still superior in this country, in some sense, that if you sit at a restaurant, they're served before a Kenyan is served. Uh, if you go through customs, a white person's gonna have an easier time going through customs. I've experienced probably the Kenyan side of it, mainly because there have been times when I went, let's say with Alma, my sister, who's obviously Kenyan, uh, to a restaurant where we'd have problems getting served, where the waiters would be rude. You know, if you look around at Kenya, when I look around at Kenya right now, 
you get a sense that, uh, although on the surface things are relatively tranquil, right beneath the surface, uh, things could explode at any point. Because you have all these young people, not just now coming from the countryside, but just simply from population growth, who are going to school, have high expectations, but uh, the engine for growth that's going to be able to uh, employ these young people may not be there. Um, and that's a dangerous situation when you have rising expectations and, and uh, young, bright people who are frustrated in their ambitions. And you see a lot of that taking place uh, in Kenya. And, and you would think that that would be more of a source of concern for the government and that they might uh, change policies as a consequence of that. But uh, so far, that, that doesn't seem to be taking place. Due to a puncture on my old car, I'm able to show my brother that Kenyans are in fact trying to shape their own destiny, despite all odds. I take him to a Juakali garage. Juakali means hot sun in Kiswahili. The garage is so named because the mechanics work outside in the hot sun. They do not have enough money to hire premises and have no support from the government or any foreign organization. They invent simple and inexpensive techniques of doing otherwise complicated jobs that would normally require expensive equipment. Normally, such garages are situated in the poorest areas of town, areas that are neglected by the state. Only the smartest can survive. There is the constant threat of being evacuated by the police. Simon, the Juakali of this garage, for that is what the mechanics are called, works many hours. His garage is specialized in VWs, and you see them parked as on a conveyor belt, one after the other on the street. The mechanics work on several cars at the same time. Simon's four sons also work in the garage. There is more than enough to do. My brother and I watch fascinated. I am pleased to have brought him here. When I look at a place like Kenya, I think this is uh, a land of great promise and that the potential to strong black country is here uh, and I think if you could build a strong black country in Kenya um, then that sends a message out throughout Africa it sends a message to black Americans it sends a message to blacks in the Caribbean uh, it sends a message that uh, we can build and, and, uh, and so I have a lot at stake uh, in this